Stu Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God. His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I am your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Thank you to our generous underwriters on Sharper Iron, the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. And Luther Classical College, a college for Lutherans by Lutherans, opening in fall 2025. Learn more at lutherclassical.org. On this Wednesday, August 31st, we are studying Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 18 through chapter 17, verse 7. Moses tells Israel of the importance of exercising true justice in the promised land, and he applies the matter first to idolatry. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Joel Heckman. Pastor Heckman serves at St. John's Lutheran Church in Okarchi, Oklahoma. Pastor Heckman, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Thank you for having me, Tim. All right, let's talk some context. We're in Deuteronomy 16 and 17 today. What should we know about what Moses has been up to leading up to the text today? Well, uh, just a little bit of broad context. We're in, obviously, the book of Deuteronomy, where Moses is giving the law of God to the people. Primarily, he's doing other things too, but he's giving the law of God to the people before they enter the promised land. This isn't really a new law. It's really building upon everything they've had previously, but Moses um, sees fit to give it to them as they're about to enter into this new land that God has promised them. And it's essentially the same reason we have the law, so that we would live according to the will of God, that the law would shape and form us into God's people. And where we find ourselves today, uh, broadly speaking, this is a portion of Deuteronomy that some people differ on where exactly it begins, but it's a lot of people refer to this portion as the central law code. Uh, which is maybe a little bit um, reductionistic in a sense or crude, um, but it's the giving of the law to the people, the central portion of that in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 1, and it runs all the way through 26, verse 15. So really our portion of the text falls uh, not quite squarely in the middle, but we're in the heart of that. And beginning in chapter 16, directly before the passage are the instructions uh, concerning various feasts that the Israelites are supposed to observe, um, namely the the feast of the Passover, um, the feast of booths and weeks, which are, you know, obviously we know Passover to be um, a remembrance of God's mercy over the Israelites when the angel of death came and passed over Israel because of the blood of the lamb spread over their doorposts. Um, And then, of course, the Feast of Booths is um, the reminder of, uh, well, actually, I guess the Feast of Weeks is a reminder that Israel was once uh, a nation that was in slavery in Egypt, but they no longer are, so remembrance of God's deliverance. And then the Feast of Booths rejoices in the fruits of harvest. And really each of these is intended to call to mind God's grace and mercy to his people, which um, which really is what prompts faithfulness in God's people. God uses that reminder through his Holy Spirit to say, here's what you once were. I've had mercy on you now. Go and live as my people. Uh, So that's really what leads up to this passage today. And then finally, uh, right after the text, uh, 17 verses 8 through 20 gives instructions um, for priests and judges, which ties well into uh, today's text where uh, the first portion we'll talk about is appointing judges and officers, and then following after that, a second part of our text in the first part of chapter 17, we'll kind of give specifics. Here's how you deal with sinners. Uh, Here's what you do. Here's the consequences. Here's how to deal with them. And then even the last portion of chapter uh, 17 uh, gives laws concerning Israel's king. So, um, 
even kings are not above the law, of course. And just a, a quick point for some other, you know, kind of unconnected context, you know, directly connected, but still very important context. Um, they give the directions in verses 16 and 17 of chapter 20, uh, not to um, build up uh, excessive silver or gold. Um, don't acquire many horses. Don't take in pagan wives. And what does Solomon do? Uh, uh, he acquires a great number of horses in 1 Kings 4.26. He married pagan wives, as we see in 1 Kings 11, uh, and built up great wealth. And so uh, we see not only are kings not above the law, but here are the dire consequences when you ignore the law. We obviously saw Israel plummet into you know, uh basically institutional idolatry in the nation of God's people because of this. So this is all to say uh, there's a reason that there's this entire book devoted to the good law of God. Uh, and and Moses, uh, God through Moses wants to make sure his people know just how much justice means to him and how important it is to avoid idolatry. So that's really a lot of the context that sets up what we see regarding justice and idolatry in today's text. Hmm. I, you know, I know we'll we'll talk more about the rest of chapter 17 tomorrow, but I do think what you said about what's coming concerning the, the laws concerning kings and the way Solomon it breaks many of those laws, I find it a helpful thing to keep in mind in this text, because as, as God sets up judges and officers, as we'll see, and we will really see justice as the overarching theme, both for this text and the, the rest of chapter 17, mm-hmm. the, the reason I think it's important is, is a comment that uh, Professor Harstad had in his commentary in the book of Deuteronomy, and he says, he said basically, you know, notice that, that God doesn't establish a legislative branch here. Mm-hmm. And he, he puts the judges over the people, but it is his law that governs everything. And I, I think that, you know, seeing how the kings are not above the law of God, just having that in our mind, and we'll, again, we'll talk about it more tomorrow, that, that's helpful because it, it does help us to understand, and we'll talk about this today at length, what justice is and what the foundation for justice really is. It starts with God's word. His mm-hmm. law sets the standard. It's not any of these human actors. They are all under that law of God. So again, I think that's that's helpful for us to keep in mind. We've got a, a shorter bit of text today, but a lot here. Uh, we're starting in Deuteronomy 16, verse 18. Moses is speaking. You shall appoint judges and officers in all your towns that the Lord your God is giving you according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality, and you shall not accept a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and subverts the cause of the righteous. Justice and only justice you shall follow, that you may live and inherit the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not plant any tree as an Asherah beside the altar of the Lord your God that you shall make, and you shall not set up a pillar which the Lord your God hates. You shall not sacrifice to the Lord your God an ox or a sheep in which is a blemish, any defect whatever, for that is an abomination to the Lord your God." If there is found among you, within any of your towns that the Lord your God is giving you, a man or a woman who does what is evil in the sight of the Lord your God in transgressing his covenant, and has gone and served other gods and worshipped them, or the sun or the moon or any of the host of heaven, which I have forbidden, and it is told you and you hear of it, then you shall inquire diligently. And if it is true and certain that such an abomination has been done in Israel, then you shall bring out to your gates that man or woman who has done this evil thing, and you shall stone that man or woman to death with stones. On the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses, the one who is to die shall be put to death. A person shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. The hand of the witnesses shall be first against him to put him to death, and afterward the hand of all the people." so you shall purge the evil from your midst. That's our text for today, Deuteronomy 16, verse 18, through chapter 17, verse 7. So again, let's keep in mind, justice is the overarching theme of this section, and even into the text we'll look at tomorrow. Moses starts this emphasis on justice by telling the people to appoint judges and officers. What's the the point of 
appointing judges and officers when they get into the promised land? Well, if you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 1, especially verses 9 through 18, uh, it, the, the heading for the section is leaders appointed. And here's what Moses has to say. Uh, At that time, I said to you, I am not able to bear you by myself, referring to the people of Israel. The Lord your God has multiplied you and behold, you are today as numerous as the stars of heaven. So there's a reference to his promise to Abraham fulfilled uh, in, in in a sense here. And then he says, may the Lord God uh, make you as new, may the Lord God, the God of your fathers, make you a thousand times as many as you are and bless you as he has promised you. But then he says again, how can I bear by myself the weight and burden of you and your strife? Choose for your tribes, wise understanding and experienced men, and I will appoint them as your heads. So really there's two purposes here. The first one we'll talk about a little bit more at length is justice um, because officers and judges were tasked with bringing justice among the people of God because there were situations where without judges and officers, justice would have been non-existent. Uh, But number two, it was really in a lot of ways to alleviate the burden of administering and and, um, enforcing and uh, creating just laws and it took that that responsibility away from Moses and the priesthood because they had so many people to take care of. So I looked and in, in entering into the promised land, uh, if you look at Numbers 2651, the, the census taken of Israel before they entered the land of Canaan, it's a little bit um, debated on what the exact number is, but suffice to say the recorded number of men of fighting age in Numbers 2651 is 600,000 people. So that doesn't include women and children. So it's essentially saying, you know, every one of these tribes and all the people in them need this spiritual care. And Moses is sort of acting as their pastor uh, with the the priesthood, with um, Aaron, the Levitical priesthood, caring for all these people as well. So God is essentially taking this responsibility and delegating it to the very own people of Israel, uh, no outside people, of course. This is something that they take care of in-house, so to speak. And so then uh, the priesthood has the opportunity to do what God has called them to do in their vocation, which is teach the law, administer sacrifices, um, facilitate worship for the people. And one passage that I actually thought of, uh, obviously it wasn't... um, Uh, connected here directly, but Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, when the church is growing um, and Paul appoints seven men to serve tables because there's a complaint that some people aren't receiving food, they're starving. And uh, Paul says, I don't want to have to give up preaching and teaching to wait on tables. Not that he's saying it's beneath me, but he's saying, if I do this, I'm not going to be able to fulfill my vocation of preaching and teaching the word of God and going around and establishing and building up churches. Um, So these are both important vocations, but this is something that God is saying explicitly here. Um, You need to appoint judges and officers in all your towns in order to have justice administered. Um, And it's uh, just to close this point here, this is really reminiscent of Luther's two kingdom or two realm theology that was just partially present. You have to remember this is just like you said, it's within the community of Israel. So there's no secular, so to speak, uh, legislators who are making laws and administering them. This is the law of God administered by his people. But we see in Luther's two realms theology, the different uh, foci that are present in each one. And we see that distinction at least foreshadowed here. Um, the big difference, obviously, is the the left-hand realm, you might speak, which is the civil realm, uh, making laws for different citizens of countries. That's something that has often secular rulers making laws that are, you know, pre- sometimes they're based directly on what people call Judeo-Christian values. A lot of the times they're, they're made for pragmatic purposes. But uh, Luther really makes a good distinction where essentially he says the left-hand realm, which is, you know, presidents, police officers, governors, all these people, they're there to keep good order in creation, to punish the evildoer, to affirm those who do good, to protect the innocent, all of this. And it's a very, uh, very much meant to preserve and protect 
and brings justice. But then the right hand realm, which would be more the priesthood and Moses, um, that's responsible for the relationship between creatures and creator, not so much creatures between each other. Um, and they use the gifts of God, the means of grace, word and sacrament uh, to bring restoration to God's people. God justifies people through that. So it, again, it's not a, a perfect one to one comparison. But if you study Luther's two realm theology, you can see a lot of similarities with what's going on here. Uh, but you can also see too, um, there's certain laws given to Israel that simply don't uh, were not meant to follow be followed by Christians today, and we'll talk about that a little bit more too. But essentially, here the goal is bring about justice and alleviate this burden of enacting and enforcing just laws from the priesthood and give it to the people of God so that the priesthood can do its job. And that's uh, something that must have been a, a an enormous relief for Moses and um, all the people who are who are taking care of the Israelites spiritually. Oh, and particularly as they're preparing to enter into the promised land, the the matter of appointing judges and officers becomes all the more important. You know, with with Moses, as you mentioned in chapter one of Deuteronomy, recounting what happened in the book of Exodus, you know, the workload on him is too much. Not only is that a consideration now in Deuteronomy 16, but I think just the fact that you're going to have people spread out throughout the land of Israel, they're not going to be in one big camp anymore. There's just a geographic need to Mm -hmm. appoint these judges and officers. So once again, seeing how Moses takes the law of God and applies it to people who are going to be living in the promised land, it's a a marvelous thing. Now, it's all for the sake of of justice. And it's remarkable, as I was reading it again out loud just a moment ago, how often the word justice shows up and and Moses emphasizes it in a variety of ways. He says it in verse, at the end of verse 18, they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not pervert justice. All these words are related, righteous judgment, justice. Uh, What is, uh, these are words that sometimes get thrown around in our world today. Justice is a really big term today. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure we understand what Moses is saying when he's talking about justice. Help us into that conversation. Well, this is a great example of just just the fact that justice and, and righteous judgment are never ever disconnected from the will of God, because it, like you said, it's very difficult to know what constitutes justice. Uh, what does it mean when we want justice and we want good judgment? Um, we say it's always connected to what is the will of God and how do we know what God's will is? Um, this is one of the definitions of the law I found quite helpful is God's will for his creation. Um, And that's given at particular times and places. There are some just laws, as we'll see today, that apply particularly to Israel in their context. But there are other laws, uh, natural laws, we call them, that have applied since the beginning of creation that God some people say hardwires into the creation. And uh, we talk about the law of God being written on man's heart. As Paul mentions in Romans, um, this is the source of justice, the standard that's set. Otherwise it's, as we say, it's completely arbitrary. And, and we'll, we'll, talk a little bit more about justice here in Deuteronomy 16, but just to reflect on cultural justice, it's rather incoherent. If you talk to, you know, go up and talk to 10 people on the street, you'll probably, and you ask them, what does it mean for people to have justice? And depending on their background, their upbringing, their uh, current uh, place of residence, the, you know, their family, their education, you might get 10 completely different answers on what it means to bring justice on the on the earth. Um, and if you ask them, you know, why is that your standard? They're, they're probably going to be fairly confident in what they say, but they're going to have a difficult time, I think, giving you a coherent, transcendent, consistent standard to apply. And this is exactly what God is doing here. Um, He is couching justice in his will and his righteousness. That's why we see uh, the word justice is used three times in this little portion. The word um, righteous is used a couple of times, especially in connection to judgment. It's all about what does God say? quite simply, uh, don't pervert justice. Well, what does it mean to pervert justice? Well, he goes into it a little bit more. Um, don't uh, accept a bribe. Don't uh, don't be partial. And 
getting focusing in on those two things specifically, it's kind of interesting that God focuses on those in particular. They're they're you know endless it seems ways to pervert justice, but here he says bribery and partiality are to have no place among you, and it doesn't mean those are the only two things that they're you know in danger of committing. But these practices don't bring about the will of God, and perhaps God knew these are going to be big temptations in such a new setting in the promised land, like you said, with so many people, uh, so many people to manage, so many personalities, so many groups of people, you're going to need to really be careful to be above bribery, which allows personal profit to influence a judge's decision, uh, but also partiality. The, the Hebrew phrase uh, to, to be partial means it says to regard faces, which was it's basically meaning to um, render justice based upon the social status of a particular group of people. And God says, no, this is not the way things are going to work. Um, and so that when we say justice, we mean what is God's will for his people? And in Deuteronomy 18, especially, we see we, God steering his people away from the corruption of money, uh, which is we see, uh, I believe it's, it's Timothy, uh, Paul writes this to Timothy, money is a root of all kinds of evil. So this is, Jesus preaches on money frequently, so that's no surprise that it's mentioned here. But there's also just this tendency, I think, with justice in our world today to steer towards I like something or I don't like something. And if I like it, if I like the outcome, that's justice. If I don't like it, that must not be justice. Um, And that's just such a shallow, superficial way to go about what is the right thing to do for this person who has sinned, who has committed a, a heinous act, and what is justice for the people who have been sinned against. Um, it's not that God doesn't care about it. Um, Christians might be accused of that sometimes. God cares very deeply about justice. And uh, just just to kind of um, bring this full circle to Christ, uh, we see God cares about justice because God's justice demands uh, punishment for sin, consequences for evil, and someone has to receive the brunt of that punishment, um, the most severe form of that punishment, which is separation from God. Now, of course, that's justice for people who reject God and die in that rejection, but for those who receive the gift of faith from God in Jesus Christ, justice is really Jesus receiving that justice, that just punishment in our place. Um, And so it's not as though we see God with such high standards of judgment and justice here and saying, well, he's inconsistent when he, you know, some people might accuse God of letting him off the hook. It's no, Jesus was on the hook uh, for us. He took um, justice in our place, took what, if basically, if you want to know what did I deserve because of my sin? Look at exactly what Jesus suffered um, on the cross. He suffered the wrath of God for our sins, the shame of the cross, the physical pain, and especially being forsaken by God. That is ultimate justice that we do not have to undergo as God's people because um, Jesus Jesus took it in our place. So God's God's perfect justice always prevails. It's not swayed by money or partiality or anything like that. So he, you know, his justice will always prevail. That's another great reminder. Um, we talk about uh, there, there's this phrase that people use: "There's no justice in the world," uh, and that is sometimes true among sinful human beings who do give in to bribery or partiality. They don't weigh the ev- evidence properly. Um, they're corrupt, and that yes does prevail in our world, and that's um, certainly terrible when it does. But a, a comforting reminder is God's justice ultimately prevails, whether or not um, that's brought about here through sinful humans. Um, And so he's really taking us, uh, purchasing us and winning us from sin's curse and then giving us this beautiful standard through which we flourish on earth when God's justice is kept, when evildoers are punished rightly according to God's will, when those who are innocent and have been victimized are cared for and given justice. But ultimately, we see God's justice will prevail. It has already prevailed um, in Christ where Again, he takes our place and receives that justice. And so when we, uh, the, I'll just close with my favorite baptismal por- portion of the baptismal liturgy um, that says when you receive that little 
garment, um, the white garment at your baptism. It's that gives you the righteousness of Christ. And it says, so shall you stand without fear before the judgment seat of God. So God still judges you righteously, just as these judges did, but it's on account of Christ that you are declared innocent and right and justified before God. So that's a, got a little long winded there, but, but it's such a important, um, teaching an important doctrine to get really, really uh, clear in a world that confuses it so much. Oh, for sure. And I, just to, to <laughs> highlight a few things, what you were saying there in, at the end about you know justice, I think we should always remember that justification, this is the same root language, I mean, root words that we're talking about. And you can check out Romans 3, particularly, where Paul talks about how God in his justice justifies sinners through Christ, as you said. And then one other thing that I, I think is just really important to highlight, and I think it comes through very well in this text. You, you said something to the effect of that, that justice is all about what does God say? And we've seen in the book of Deuteronomy in multiple points how the people of Israel are told by Moses, keep God's word, hold on to God's word, don't add to it, don't subtract to it, teach your children, talk about it all the time. The centrality of God's word for the for the people of God has been emphasized so often. And the way that you see Moses talk about justice here and, and saying, you've got to, to hold on to justice, you've got to do justice, don't pervert it. I think we're right to, to put those two things together, that in what God says, that's where we see true justice. When we when we listen to his word and seek to do his will, that's going to put us on this path of justice. Mm -hmm. Moses has a lot more to say about justice. We're going to take our break and pick that conversation up on the other side. You're listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. We're talking about Deuteronomy 16 and 17 with Pastor Joel Heckman. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that Lutherans are helping new American immigrants get settled? How about struggling church workers in need of support and refreshment? And we assist at-risk children and provide disaster response to hurricane victims. Through LCMS recognized service organizations, we are doing all this and more. I'm Rahema Kavuga of Lutheran Church Extension Fund, and I don't want you to miss out on hearing what your brothers and sisters in Christ are up to. Visit interesttime.org to see how your support gives life to these works of mercy and love. What do you think of when you hear the word college? Expensive? Liberal? Woke? Imagine a college that is affordable. A college that is unapologetically conservative and Lutheran. A college that won't take a dime of federal funding. A college that teaches the best of our Western heritage. A college where students grow in the Christian faith instead of leaving it behind. This is Luther Classical College. A college by Lutherans and for Lutherans. Visit our website, lutherclassical.org. Subscribe, become a patron, and join the thousands who are making Luther Classical College a reality. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Wednesday, August 31st. We're studying Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 18 through chapter 17, verse 7 with Pastor Joel Heckman. He serves at St. John's Lutheran Church in Okarchi, Oklahoma. Pastor Heckman, prior to the break, we left off about verse 20, where again, Moses emphasizes justice, justice, only justice you shall follow. Give us some of the highlights from that verse. So two things to focus on here. One is a rhetorical that sort of, you might say a rhetorical tool that Moses uses, which is repetition. Uh, you see this a lot in the Psalms where you have the first verse will say, make a statement about God. And the last verse makes a, the same statement. And that's really the point of emphasis and everything in between is really um, supporting that statement. Well, the same thing's happening here where in verse 20, you see justice and only justice you shall follow. Why does he make a point to say that word twice? He's wanting to bring attention to its importance. Um, God, Once again, God cares about justice, especially in Canaan. We see many um, directives about those who are orphaned, those who are widowed, the poor, the sojourner, anyone who might um, <clears throat> be more vulnerable in the culture and be potentially, you know, at more danger of abuse when justice is absent. Uh, Moses makes doubly certain here uh, to emphasize justice is the only thing you shall follow. Um, when justice is absent, I thought of the verses in Judges 
that our hearers may be familiar with, especially Judges 17, 6 and Judges 21, verse 25, which say, In those days there was no king in Israel, and each man did what was right in his own eyes. So it was essentially saying there is no... Uh, there's no justice, there's no law of God, there's no one to enforce the law or see that what is right in God's eyes is done. When you take God's justice away, what's left, it's such a such a, a poignant phrase, each one did what was right in his own eyes. And that might be one of the best definitions for secular justice. It's what's right in your own eyes or right in the eyes of the most people at a particular time. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so it's, it's a, re- again, a, a great rhetorical tool here, justice and wait, 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 before I go on only justice, that's what you need to follow. And it just makes you stop and pay attention a little bit more and say, if this is the thing he's emphasizing twice, uh, I probably ought to pay attention to it. Uh, second thing. And, and then we, um, we could we can move on to verse twenty one, but I, I just want to focus on uh, the verb follow. Uh, really, really easy to kind of gloss over it in verse twenty. You shall follow um, justice that you may live and inherit the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Uh, this I have to give credit to my uh, s- former seminary classmate and fellow brother in the ministry, Andy Hadassal, um, who is a, a, a Hebrew wizard. <laughs> I like to think of him. Uh, I, I said, I've got a Hebrew question for you, which is completely unrelated to this. And then he gave me this tidbit. Um, so that that verb follow, I believe it's radaf in the Hebrew, um, <clears throat> is the same verb in Psalm 23, verse 6, when David writes, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, which means to pursue or follow after earnestly. And then it's also used in military context. When you look, a a good example is Judges 20, verse 43, when it describes the army of the men of Israel pursuing and following and surrounding the tribe of Benjamin. So what's the point with this? Um, and the point is we are to pursue justice as fervently and aggressively as an army pursues, surrounds, and captures its enemy, or even better yet, as I as I think, um, we are to pursue justice as fervently as the mercy and goodness of God pursues us, um, which, of course, for sinful humans is impossible, but we thank God that through his word and spirit, he brings about that justice through us. But that's another... Another great point of emphasis is that verb is is not just, uh, you know, follow justice kind of like a puppy follows his master. No, no, follow it like it's, you know, like like you're pursuing it, like your life depends on it, so, so to speak. Or, or like think of the way the Lord God is faithful in pursuing sinners and reconciling them to him. That's the fervency with which you pursue this standard among you. So I I thought those were two really interesting points uh, to bring out that might not be readily apparent in this text. So having laid that foundation of just how central justice is for his people, God then, through Moses, provides some examples. And that's really where the end of 16 and all of chapter 17, this is justice put into practice. The end of 16 starts with a couple of examples about planting a tree as an Asherah and setting up a pillar. These two are forbidden to God's people. Again, we're going to tie this to justice. What's what's going on in these two verses? So specifically here, we see Moses referring to Asherah, who was the Canaanite goddess and the wife of the chief Canaanite god, Ale. And this is not to say, uh, you know, trees are bad or pillars are bad in themselves. It's just when they're connected to pagan worship practices, that's where it's, it, it gets into sinful territory. Uh, so an Asherah pole was just a tree carved in the image of the goddess Asherah, which would not only be a symbol that would um, legitimize her, but it would actually pay her homage, a, a pagan image that they could worship and say this goddess provides us one thing or another. Um, And the the Asherah poles were actually placed right next to other pagan objects of worship, including sacred stones or pillars, which is the other thing that God hates. So it's not like God hates rocks and trees. God hates these things when they're used um, for idolatry, basically. 
And it's really interesting to note when Joshua went into the promised land, one of the first things he did when they conquered a Canaanite city was to utterly demolish the high places, the pagan places in these cities. Uh, so, so one example I, I kind of want to give, it's because I, I found this picture and I think I, I need to use this because I took a class on this. Um, so seminary took a group of people over to Concordia seminary, took a people of group, group of people over to Israel, uh, the spring after I graduated and we got to see one of these sites, uh, in the promised land where, Joshua would have burned down a pagan Canaanite site. And there's a picture where there's about a a thick slab of stone, about three feet tall and about a foot and a half deep. And the stones above it are are kind of a white cream color, but below it there's gray and black covering this huge slab of stone. And to burn it to the point where it changed that color, the temperature would have had to have reached 2,300 degrees. So the point that our our guide gave us was um, from this utter, you know, devastating destruction. Joshua leaves no doubt that pagan places such as this um, pagan temple honoring gods like Ale and Asherah is absolutely no place in God's creation. Um, these Asherah poles and pillars were cult objects of Canaanite worship, and they they have no place. They cannot coexist with with God, and and so maybe a a great way to sum this up is what does Luther describe as a God? He says a God is the term for that to which we are to look for all good and in which we are to find refuge in all need. Therefore to have a God is nothing else than to trust and believe in that one with your whole heart. So what is Moses, you know, through God trying to uh, prevent here? Well, the big temptation going into the land of Canaan would be to, um, kind of synchronize uh, your worship with theirs, try to kind of commingle them, which of course was a problem when the kings started coming along and Solomon introduced idol worship. But he's saying, in particular, you're vulnerable to worshiping Asherah and setting up pillars. And what does that do? It, it separates you from God. It violates your your relationship, your covenant relationship with God, and there. Are, there really probably isn't anything more severe in terms of the consequence of the sin than that. Um, And so it's not simply something where we say, well, we don't worship trees and stones today. Luther is saying that was a a God that they were in danger of worshiping in Israel. We need to ask, what is my chief source of comfort and security? Uh, What do I fear losing most in life? What receives my best time and energy and affection? And if it's anything other than God, that quite simply is idolatry, uh, the same idolatry that that Israel was warned against. So, so in highlighting particular forms of worship that are forbidden here, Moses is saying, be very, very careful in terms of how you interact with the people in this new land, because you're very susceptible as sinners to worshiping other things. And this is something that we'll see in the, the closing verses here. What's the consequence for that? But um, idolatry is simply just something that you fear, love, and trust in more than God. And that's what Moses was steering away the people from with this with this um, statement here. And I, I think it, it's important, again, just to keep it in the context of justice. You know, in, in our world today, I think when we hear justice, we think of a word like fairness between people. And yet, just after Moses says, hey, it's really, really important that you keep justice and pursue it when you get to the promised land, the first thing he talks about is idolatry. Just, again, that connection between justice and true worship of the Lord, according Mm -hmm. to his word, what God says, Moses keeps that connection really, really carefully. And I I think that's, we would do well as Christians to keep that in our minds when we hear conversations about justice today and try to evaluate them. We always had to do it according to the word of God, (laughs) such that the matter of idolatry, while it might not make it into a conversation about justice in our secular world today, for us as Christians— worship of the true God is a part of true justice. And we, we should keep that in mind. I think it's, it's just a helpful thing for us to see in this text, mm-hmm. even if, as you said, the, the penalty for idolatry that's coming, we don't execute that same penalty today, but, but justice really, it is, we can only rightly know it when we know who the true God is 
according to his word. That that mm-hmm. point, I think, needs to stay stay central for us. Yeah. So as we move into chapter 17, verse 1 maybe seems a little bit out of place, but I think it being involved in the matter of worship helps us keep it central in this in between these matters of idolatry. Take us into verse 1 and, and why God is concerned about what kind of animal you sacrifice. Right. So this is moving away from idolatrous work, worship and then we're moving into um, a form of worship that isn't so much idolatry, but it's unfaithful worship according to the standards God has set up. So if an animal had a defect such as blindness, we see you should not sacrifice to the Lord your God an ox or sheep in which is a blemish or any defect whatever for that is an abomination to the Lord your God. So it could have been anything, uh, you know, a a broken leg, blindness, things like that. Um, A flawed animal was not sufficient to atone for the sins of the people. Um, This was the purpose of the sacrifice, which if you go back to Leviticus chapter 1, verse 3, or even Deuteronomy uh, 15, verses 19 through 23, um, this was the system established by God to atone for the sins of the people in a burnt offering. It was meant to be um, flawless in place of the flawed, sinful people of God. Uh, So they confessed their sins in worship, And then those sins were transferred uh, symbolically to the animal who was sacrificed, similar to that scapegoat uh, practice on the Day of Atonement where the sins were placed upon the scapegoat and it's sent outside the camp to say, your sin has been removed as this goat is being removed from the camp. Um, But this God says, my my means of atoning for you involves uh, something without blemish. You have sinned, you are blemished, you need something that's unblemished to take your place. And so this was, of course, pointing to, you know, we see when when John the Baptist says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, he was the Lamb without blemish. We see in Isaiah 52 and 53, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Um, but Jesus is the perfect Lamb of God. The altar he was sacrificed on was not an Old Testament altar, it was the cross uh, to atone for our sins. And, and really, um, these Old Testament sacrifices were based in this promise of a Messiah, a perfect Messiah, who would be the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. Um, we see that lent in him not all the blood of beasts, um, and that's about where my memory of the lyrics ends. <laughs> um, but that's referring to this, not all the blood of beasts could atone for our sins. It's just, the, it's you know, um, Abel's blood for vengeance pleads for the skies, but the blood of Jesus for our pardon cries. I remember that too. <laughs> Um, but, but that's exactly what it's referring to here is the blood of a pure unblemished animal is meant to be sacrificed to remind you that you are blemished by your sin, but this unblemished thing is taking your place. And that's exactly what Jesus is. Um, when an animal was sacrificed for the people, it was for their atonement and forgiveness, but it was also foreshadowing, foreshadowing Jesus as the perfect substitutionary atonement for our sins. So we are blemished. We cannot, you know, offer ourselves as a sacrifice. Our good works are dirty rags, as the scriptures say, but the unblemished person of Jesus Christ, true man and true God who lived perfectly unblemished and then was willingly sacrificed in our place. Uh, Even the story of Abraham and Isaac, that ram that was provided for the sacrifice, it's all pointing to Jesus, and that's why God requires these unblemished animals because it reflects the perfect Son of God who would die on their behalf. And I think that, that that's the reason it does show up in this context of idolatry. Not that it's an out and out matter of idolatry, but it is taking the worship that God has given into your own hands. And you ignore then the teaching of Christ. So if, if I think, hey, I'm just going to offer this animal. It's, it's an animal. What's, what's the problem? Well, the problem is that that blemished animal does not point us toward Christ. You're, you're taking something 
outside of the word of God, which mm-hmm. is, as we said, that's where injustice lies. And and so that, I think, is the connection, the reason that you see it show up in this context, because it is a matter of, of going outside the ways of justice, outside the word of God, even in a small matter, which, as you said, it ends up being a pretty big matter, because the the true form of worship points us toward Christ. So I, I looked up the hymn that, that you were talking about, and it's, <laughs> it's a glorious hymn. It's, it's Isaac Watts. He, it's number 431 in Lutheran Service Book, and, and just the first two stanzas, not all the blood of beasts on Jewish altars slain could give a guilty conscience peace or wash away the stain. But Christ, the heavenly lamb, takes all our sins away, a sacrifice of nobler name and richer blood than they. And and that's the reason why it matters which animal you sacrifice, because that animal is not there to to, for its own sake, it's mm-hmm. there to point you toward Christ, the sacrifice of nobler name, who actually does take your sins away by his blood shed for you. He is the unblemished sacrifice. John the Baptist, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. That sermon should always be echoing in mm-hmm. our minds when we read about sacrifices in the Old Testament. So, Pastor Heckman, that, that brings us to the, the final section here, uh, which is is similar to something we've heard in Deuteronomy already, but is, is probably just as shocking, even though we've already heard it before. The, the last matter, verses 2 to 7, talk about someone accused and ultimately convicted of idolatry, and then the, mm-hmm. the death penalty that's described for them. We've got about eight minutes here on the morning to, to walk through what is perhaps a challenging text to us, and yet one that when we consider it in light of all of God's word, in light of Christ, uh, is is important for us to hear. So take us into this last section of our text, uh, verses 2 to 7 of chapter 17. Right. And real quick, I need to make a con- uh, correction. <laughs> uh, Abel's blood for vengeance, that verse is from glory be to Jesus in 433. So let the record show. There you go. All right. It's, it, we'll, <laughs> we'll allow the mashing up of him. Yes. The, a medley. Yes. A medley. <laughs> uh, so this this portion is is perhaps the most difficult portion of the text, um, just trying to make sense of what the commandment here is. So if someone is accused of idolatry, they're handed over to the judges and officers that have been appointed as per 16 verses 18 through 20. And once that process of justice has been followed and on the basis of two or three witnesses, they have been found guilty of doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord, transgressing the covenant, serving other gods and worshiping the very sins they were told just a moment ago not to commit. Um, then the punishment is to be stoned to death. And this, for my for, for my experience reading the text and reflecting on it, uh, there's two things that really stand out. First, this is how seriously God takes sin, and this is what justice demands in this particular situation. Again, that perfect justice. So God takes sin seriously by enforcing that justice. He, re- he reminds us of that. But then second, it just points to really the greater punishment that was given to Christ on our behalf. And and that's maybe the first point I want to make kind of as a sub point. Um, this is a just punishment for sin. Uh, we, As much as we cringe seeing you shall stone that man or woman to death with stones, this is just punishment because go back to Romans 6.23. Uh, This is not just true when Paul wrote it in Romans. It's always been true. The wages of sin is death. Um, So truthfully, any punishment short of death for any kind of sin is merciful on God's part when he withholds that punishment. As we see, especially um, go back to Genesis at the fall, Adam and Eve ought to have been killed then, uh, and not just killed, but condemned eternally. But God in his mercy um, preserved them. He cast them out of the garden, but he then made that promise that a Messiah is going to come along. You see the same thing with Cain and Abel. Um, Cain murders Abel, and he deserves you know, an eye for an eye uh, sort of punishment, um, but God has mercy on him. But we have to remember, if someone is stoned to death for idolatry, it's, A, God is taking sin seriously and says, this is a an extremely severe sin that is so detrimental for your faith. I'm going to stigmatize it and deter it as greatly as possible with the penalty of death. Um, but we also have to remember uh, we, we cannot impose our human understanding of what is right or wrong or just over and above God's perfect standard of justice. We might say that seems a little harsh, God, but really 
anything less than that is 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 you know merciful according to God's standards. So we are the ones who are guilty of sin. We are not the ones who know what is best and good and right. If we trust that God is who he says he is, which is merciful, just, righteous, then this, we have to conclude that this is the just punishment for it. Um, and it's really important to remember too, um, how important it is to rightly establish justice. Because if you go and accuse someone and they're condemned, you are the one who has to throw the first stone. Uh, so you don't take this accusation lightly. I mean, just imagine having to throw the first stone when you've lied about something. Um, this person isn't actually guilty, but it's too late and you have to throw the first stone. So th- this is something that is meant to say you need to take this seriously because you're taking part in the punishment. You better be sure this person is guilty. Now, why, um, why is this something that is okay but then we had the fifth commandment, you will not murder. Well, that's that's the difference. This is punishment for sin. Murder is killing with malicious intent. Um, but God authorizes humans to put to death other humans when a particular situation merits it. We talk about the death penalty. Um, we see this uh, a little bit actually in Romans 13 verse 4 where, I mean, that's a whole, whole nother discussion about the death penalty. Very, very controversial. But Romans 13, verse 4, Paul is talking about the civil authorities, and he says they do not bear the sword in vain, which is roughly equivalent to the death penalty. Um, The civil authorities have the authority to do that uh, in our modern world. Now, who is, you know, worthy of the death penalty? Uh, Who commits a sin that merits that? That's another, you know, topic that's up for debate. But um, this is certainly something that uh, God has said this is a just punishment in certain situations, and one of those situations is when someone has rejected God, turned their back on him, and gone to worship idols. That's how seriously God takes this sin. Now, now, two more points I want to make. Um, first of all, the last phrase is extremely important to keep in mind. So shall you purge the evil from your midst. The goal is not to kill someone willy-nilly because you're angry at them. Uh, It's not some arbitrary punishment that says we're really, uh, really angry at you for doing this. No, this is to purge the evil of idolatry completely from your midst. Um, God says he hates idolatry. He despises idol worship. Uh, Anything less than justice is an abomination to God. And this is really in a way God backing up these commands of the law. He's saying, um, it is such a such a serious sin, such a serious affront to your relationship with your creator. This is punishable by death. Uh, why don't we stone people who break the first commandment today? Uh, the simple answer is it's not explicit command of God anymore because uh, this is the Mosaic law we're talking about given for Israel, fulfilled by Christ, of course. Um we continue to follow, as we said a little bit earlier, God's transcendent moral law. So there is still, you know, we still follow the Ten Commandments because that's a uh, concise exposition of, you know, kind of the heart of God's law. Um, but we don't follow laws given specifically to Israel and for Israel. This was given at a particular time and place. Um, but we still do purge the evil from our midst with other means. Uh, if you go to 1 Corinthians 5, um, especially verses 1 through 13, Paul is giving directives for discipline in the church. And he says, you are to, he uses this phrase from Deuteronomy, you are to purge the evil from among you. Um, Here he's saying the purpose uh, is not to completely cut them off. That was the purpose in Israel. Here, if you look at verse 5, he says, um, this is to, we are handing this person over to Satan in order that the person may be restored. So, uh, again, a whole nother discussion on church discipline is, is good and right at some point. Um, but s- suffice to say, we still do have punishments for people who, you know, live in sin, commit sin or unrepentant, and that's cutting them off from God's community, which is which is pretty serious. Um, if you think stoning is serious, excommunication is a very, very serious as well. So that's the point. Um, we're taking sin seriously. We're giving a just punishment that God has directed us to give. But ultimately, this points to, again, the greater punishment that Christ took for us. Um, 
we deserve separate, not just death, but separation from God. Um, and Christ, again, suffered that on the basis of two or three witnesses. He, you know, was wrongly accused. Um, and then they didn't hurl stones at him. They hurled the words crucify at him. But then while we were still sinners, guilty of all these things that we deserve death for, Christ died for us. Uh, so going back to that one passage we talked about, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. And one last thing to point out real quick. I was thinking earlier about justice, um, connecting it to Christ and these standards that are given here. Uh, The hymn stricken, smitten and afflicted. There's this phrase that says the deepest stroke that pierced him, Jesus, was the stroke that justice gave. And that's a great way to sum this up. The stroke of justice came down not on us but on Christ. So we do follow the law. We take God's law seriously. We take justice seriously. We strive for that. But our righteousness and justification are ultimately in Christ who took the consequences of God's justice for us. Um, And that's a comforting reminder with this text. Pastor Joel Heckman is pastor at St. John's Lutheran Church in Okarchi, Oklahoma, helping us today with Deuteronomy 16, verse 18, through chapter 17, verse 7. Pastor Heckman, thanks for being our guest today. Thank you so much, Tim. God cares about justice. That is why he gives his word, that we might have his justice. And he gives that justice to us in Christ, who received the justice of God against our sin so that we might be justified by faith in him. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Please, if you have any questions, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. We always love to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.